Welcome trainers to the Pokemon Historian, where we take a deep dive into the vintage world of Pokemon cards. Today, we're going to uncover the mysteries, perhaps one of the best unknown sets out there, the Vending Machine series. The Vending Machine series was released as three separate set of cards, named after the original Pokemon games on the Nintendo Game Boy. Series 1, or Blue, was released in March 23rd, 1998. Series 2, or Red, was released June 17th, 1998. And Series 3, or Green, was released on November 24th, 1998. The Vending Machine series, a name affectionately coined by collectors, offered a unique twist to the usual Pokemon card collecting experience. Unlike standard expansions, where players could acquire a variety of cards from booster packs, these distinctive cards were only available through randomized sheets dispensed from a vending machine. This unusual method of distributing not only made the series stand out, but also posed a challenge in obtaining cards in pristine condition due to the cards having been peeled out of sheets, which often damaged them on arrival with minor chips or rips. These cards were printed on glossy cardstock, a departure from the regular matte finish. This glossy style gained popularity from 1998 to 2001, especially for promotional cards in magazines like Car Car. Many of these designs were later incorporated into the Red Green deck, Pokemon's early foray into battle decks, but were printed on a standard matte cardstock. This variation increased their desirability among collectors, with some cards even receiving a holographic reprint. Most of these unique cards never made their way outside Japan due to the probable cost implications of similar distribution methods in the West. For the few that did, they were transformed into Wizard Black Star promos, distributed internationally through the Pokemon League during the 2001-2002 season. The series cards and artwork mirrored the trajectory of the original games released for the Nintendo Game Boy, creating a distinct connection between the cards and the in-game experience. This not only allowed players to collect cards parallel to their game storyline, but also gave each card, from common all the way up to rare, its own narrative to tell. The diversity of artists involved in this set, ranging from professionals to contest winners, added its unique charm, making it a truly fascinating collection to acquire and revisit. Now, without further ado, let's delve into the specific differences between each of the sets. At the 7th Next Generation World Hobby Fair in December 1997, attendees were treated to an exclusive sneak peek, a preview expansion sheet featuring the illustrious trio of Pikachu, Mewtwo and Mew. These cards, while officially unnumbered and promotional in nature, have since been embraced as the prologue to the vending machine series, affectionately termed Series 00. They represent the first glimpse into the upcoming collection distributed to the attendees during the fair. While Mewtwo and Pikachu graced the western shores as promotional cards tied to the original Pokemon movie, the Mew card remained an exclusive treasure, elusive to enthusiasts outside of Japan. We begin our exploration of the Series 1 Blue set, embarking on a delightful journey through the iconic world of the original Red and Blue games. Our adventure starts in the familiar setting of Professor Oak's laboratory, which unfolds across three detailed sheets. Here you're greeted with a choice of a starter Pokemon, Bulbasaur, Charmander or Squirtle, alongside a collection of other common Pokemon. As we delve deeper, our journey takes us to the enchanting Viridian Forest, a place where the elusive Pikachu may be spotted. Next we venture to the mystical depths of Mount Moon a haven for moonstones and of course the very rare Clefairy. The excitement continues in the Safari Zone, offering a chance to encounter some of the rarer game Pokemon like Chansey, Lickitung and Pinsir. Our first foray into the mystical Cerulean Cave is a highlight, presenting an opportunity to challenge the newly escaped, genetically modified Pokemon from Cinnabar Island. Concluding our Series 1 Blue Escapade, we take a much needed rest in Celadon City where you can acquire unique Pokemon like Porygon and Eevee. This series also introduces us to the concept of contest cards, a unique feature where trainers showcase their artistic talents by drawing their favourite Pokemon. The card game illustration contest held on the 15th of October 1997 saw three outstanding entries emerge as winners. Polyrath, Snorlax and Mr. Mine. The talented artists who drew these cards not only received 20 copies of their card, 
also had their creations included in the full release set of Series Blue, alongside the prestigious Pokemon Illustrator card. We continue our journey as Series 2, or Red. We delve deeper into the world of the iconic game locations, beginning our adventure in the mysterious rock tunnel. Armed with TM Flash, we illuminate the dark passages, uncovering a hidden ditto amongst the cave dwellers. Our journey then takes us to the electrifying power plant, where we encounter the majestic legendary bird Pokemon Zapdos, along with a host of electric type companions. A swift surf across the waters brings us to the frosty sea foam islands, offering a rare glimpse of the icy legendary bird Articuno. As we collect our final badges, our quest leads us to Victory Road, a haven for some of the most formidable Pokemon, including the fiery legendary bird Moltres. Our next stop is Saffron City, where we face a unique challenge at the Fighting Dojo, earning the opportunity to select an iconic Pokemon from the Karate Master. Our adventure in Saffron City doesn't end there though. We infiltrate Sylphco, receiving Lapras as a generous gift, and cleverly reclaiming the Master Ball from Giovanni. As our journey concludes, on the shores of Cinnabar Island, where we breathe new life into our fossils at the Cinnabar Lab, transforming them back into Pokemon once again. Series 2, Red, immerses us further into the game's essence, showcasing key Pokemon and items pivotal to these locations. For those who grew up with the game in the 90s, these places, Pokemon and items will undoubtedly rekindle cherished moments of you playing the game. The Pokemon featured in this series have clearly been meticulously selected to resonate with the game's narrative, enhancing our nostalgic journey through the set and the game. In the captivating finale of our series, Series 3 Green, we explore new and intriguing locations. Lavender Town, surrounded in mystery and known for its Pokemon graveyard, offers a chilling atmosphere. This is where we first encounter ghost-type Pokemon, like Haunter and Ghastly, accompanied by the eerie Pokemon Tower trainer card. Meanwhile, the Sea Cottage provides a unique twist in the game, the place where you meet Bill after his unexpected transformation into a Pokemon. Here, players can access the Pokemon transfer, Bill's PC, and encounter Pokemon that evolve through trading, something that will be very important later on in this series. What truly distinguishes Series 3 Green are the transformative extra rule cards. These cards introduce unique gameplay elements to the card game, like damage from confusion, a deck switch rule where players swap decks after each set, and an exciting 3 on 3 Dugtrio rule where trainers would form teams of 3 and battle it out. Moreover, Series 3 boasts contributions from industry legends. Mr. E. Makuni, known for his eccentric musical contributions to the Pokemon anime, and of course his very unique dress style, and Uiyama, one of the original game designers for the Pokemon trading card game and Pokemon Duel, lend their expertise to these sets. Uiyama, also known for his work on Earthbound, brought his artistic vision to life in this series, creating some truly iconic cards. These contributions from industry veterans add a layer of depth and nostalgia, making Series 3 Green a memorable and outstanding addition to the Pokemon trading card game. In our final segment, we spotlight the exquisite Masaki Vending Machine promotional cards, featuring Gengar, Golem, Machamp, Alakazam, and Omastar. This promotion was a masterstroke of fan engagement. Trainers could mail in Bill's PC Pass card, found in Series 3, along with specific Pokemon cards that normally evolve via trade in the games. Media Factory, the company offering this promotion, would then send back a dazzling Hollyfoil promo card. This initiative clearly replicated the trading evolution concept from the Game Boy games, with Bill's PC acting as the virtual trading platform. As we know, Bill's PC was found in Series 3 or Green. But what about the pre-evolutions offered for the trade? They were of course also attainable from the same vending machine sheets, but players had the flexibility to send any version of the target's card pre-evolution, ranging from the base set all the way up to the vending machine series to claim their shiny promo card. Upon their return, these promo cards were presented in a special cardboard holder, accompanied by a thank you note for participating in the campaign. 
However, this packaging method often resulted in indents or folds, making it quite challenging to find these cars in pristine condition. After the campaign, Media Factory shed some light on their project in Trainers Magazine Volume 2. The campaign was a roaring success, attracting over 140,000 participants. The magazine even provided a breakdown of the distribution numbers for each promo card, with Alakazam leading the pack at 39,000 copies, Gengar with 36,000 copies, Machamp with 29,000 copies, Golem with 22,000 copies, and Amistar with 21,000 copies. This detailed insight highlighted the immense popularity and impact of the campaign among Pokemon enthusiasts. As we wrap up our nostalgic journey through the enchanting world of the Vending Machine series, it's clear that these unique sets have left a mark on the history of Pokemon card collecting. From the glossy finishes of the cards and the gameplay elements introduced in Series 3, each set has its own unique flavour to the Pokemon universe. The Vending Machine series stands as a testament to the creativity and ingenuity of the early days of Pokemon. It bridged the gap between the digital adventures on the Game Boy and the physical thrill of card collecting, bringing to life the beloved creatures and locations in a way that resonated deeply with the friends. The Masaki promos with their clever tie-in to in-game mechanics showed just how interactive Pokemon card collecting could be. The overwhelming response to these promotions, as evidenced by the staggering number of participants, underscores the enduring appeal and passion of the Pokemon community. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey. Stay tuned for more deep dives into the vintage world of Pokemon cards, right here on Pokemon Historian. <laughs>